In 1891, when Thomas Edison invented the kinetograph and the kinetoscope, motion pictures began to slowly change how people were entertained. During this time, other prominent peephole pioneers would lay down the foundation of what would become the movies. One of these innovators was Georges Méliès, an illusionist and stage magician, whom would be one of the first true special effects artists. In this video, Joe and I are going to turn back the clock further than we normally do and look at the infancy of film and one of its earliest successful filmmakers, Georges Méliès. As with every video, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, and become a patron on our Patreon page. All links will be down below. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy a look into a time when one discovery opened up an endless world of possibilities. Enjoy. Marie Georges Jean Melier was born on December 8, 1861, in Paris, France. The son of two successful bootmakers, Melier grew up quite wealthy. When he was seven, Paris was in the middle of the Franco Prussian War, and he was sent to a prestigious school to continue his education. This kind of formal education disputes what many said about the early filmmakers, that they were illiterates, incapable of producing anything artistic. This was obviously ridiculous, and Georges Méliès was about to plant the seeds of his creative excellence. Méliès was often criticized by his teachers for constantly drawing on his notebooks, but he couldn't help it. While studying, he began to build his own puppets out of cardboard. When he became a teenager, he moved on to more sophisticated marionettes. Melier's creative side would take a brief halt after he graduated in 1880. He worked with his brothers Henry and Gaston in the family shoe business and then served three years in the military as was required. Following his service, his father sent him to London to improve his English and work as a clerk for one of their friends. It was in London that Georges Méliès would develop a new passion, stage magic. While he was working as a clerk in London, Méliès would visit the Egyptian Hall, which was run by illusionist John Neville Maskeline. He fell in love with stage magic and even had plans to study painting. However, his father flat out refused to support him financially if his son went in this direction, so Georges had no choice but to take a job supervising the machinery at his family's factory. During this time, he married Eugenie Genin and had two children, Georgette and André. He still kept his dream of being a stage magician alive by attending performances at the theater Robert Houdin, founded by legendary magician Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. Houdin's legacy inspired future magician and escape artist Harry Houdini, who adopted the Houdini name as a tribute to Houdin. Georges Méliès was able to take magic lessons from a man named Emile Voisin, who allowed him to perform his first public shows at different venues. In 1888, Méliès' father retired, and he decided to sell his share of the company to his brothers. The money he received, plus help from his wife's dowry, he was able to purchase the theater Robert Houdin. The theater was very well equipped and had just about everything he needed except one thing, new illusions and tricks. Many felt that the current ones at the time were out of date, something needed to be done. This is Melia's creative side really coming out. He would spend the next nine years creating over 30 new illusions, both comedic and melodramatic. One of his best known illusions was the recalcitrant decapitated man, in which a professor's head is cut off in the middle of a speech and continues talking until it's returned to his body. Illusions like this increased audience attendance dramatically. Georges Melier was finally living his dream and he couldn't be happier. However, it would be 1895 that would begin to propel the illusionist into a new medium, and eventually, into the history books. 
On December 28, 1895, Georges Méliès attended a special private demonstration from the Lumière brothers, Auguste and Louise. Their cinematograph was innovative, improving upon Thomas Edison's kinetograph. Méliès was so impacted by the brothers' demonstration that he offered them 10,000 francs for their machine, but it was turned down. Apparently, the Lumière brothers turned down others that night who offered more money, wanting to make sure the focus was more on the scientific nature. Méliès decided to look at other inventors who were experimenting with their own camera designs, although theirs were not as sophisticated as the Lumière brothers. After viewing the animatograph from Robert W. Paul, a scientific instrument maker, he purchased one and studied the mechanics of it. With a bit of tinkering, Méliès adapted the animatograph to serve as a film camera. He also had to buy unperforated film in London, as raw film stock and film processing labs were not yet available in Paris, causing Méliès to learn how to develop and print his films on his own. In 1896, Georges Méliès, along with partners Lucien Corsten and Lucien Rolos, patented the kinetograph Robert Houdin. This was a cast iron camera projector that Méliès would refer to as his coffee grinder and machine maker due to the noise the camera would make. It was not long before Paris finally acquired more efficient cameras and Méliès was finally able to have better looking films. He made these films in a style not seen before, showing tricks which would be considered as the first special effects. One of Méliès' special effects was to have objects disappear or change size. These films contained no narrative. They were merely made to show the different possibilities with film. In fact, it can be safely said that without Georges Méliès, special effects may not have come around until much later. One of his experiments centered around multiple exposure, which is on full display in his 1900 film, The One Man Band. In this film, Méliès plays several different characters simultaneously. Other films that featured early special effects were The Execution of Mary Stewart, The Vanishing Lady,
the famous box trick? Bluebeard and the man with the rubber head. In 1902, Georges Méliès would make his greatest and most well-known film ever, A Trip to the Moon. Loosely based on two different books, Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon and H.G. Wells's The First Men in the Moon, the film stars Méliès as a professor who is the president of the Astronomers Club. He proposes an expedition to the moon, which his colleagues agree to. The spaceship they used is designed like a large artillery shell, which is launched out of a large cannon. As the camera zooms in on the moon, a face begins to appear on it. The ship then pierces the eye of said face. The image of the spaceship hitting and being stuck in the moon's eye is one of the most recognizable and iconic images in cinema history. A trip to the moon in its entirety is 14 minutes, 
Melier's longest film at that time. The film was highly successful, with Melier selling both black and white and hand-colored versions to his exhibitors. While a trip to the moon made Melier famous worldwide, there were issues with his newfound fame in the U.S. Producers such as Thomas Edison, Sigmund Lubin, and William Selig produced illegal copies of the film and made money off of them. As you can imagine, Melier was very upset by this, causing him to create a New York office for his company Star Films and hired his brother Gaston to run it. Their charter had these words, and I quote, In opening a factory and office in New York, we are prepared and determined energetically to pursue all counterfeiters and pirates. We will not speak twice, we will act, unquote. The copyright infringement was so bad that Melier discovered the Biograph studio paying royalties to film promoter Charles Urban. I'm not sure if he ever got justice against those that pirated his film, but it just goes to show how easy it was to do such a thing simply because the creator was in a different country. The last thing I want to say about A Trip to the Moon is what Georges Méliès himself said about it later on in life. He remarked that the film was, and I quote, surely not one of my best. Although he acknowledged the indelible mark it left on cinema history by saying that it left an indelible trace because it was the first of its kind, A Trip to the Moon is a true masterpiece of cinema, showing the incredible creativity of one man who showed illusions on film by using the same techniques he learned as a stage magician. Georges Méliès followed up his biggest success with other classics such as The Coronation of Edward VIII, Gulliver's Travels Among the Lilliputians and the Giants, The Kingdom of the Fairies, The Barber of Seville, and The Impossible Voyage. The Impossible Voyage was similar to A Trip to the Moon, in that a group of people are in a vehicle that goes up to the sun rather than the moon. This trip is also not planned, and just like A Trip to the Moon, the sun shows a face and swallows the ship whole. These films cemented Georges Méliès as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time as far as film historians go. By 1907, his success began to decline, and in 1908, he made the film Humanity Through the Ages, a project he was prouder of than any other film he had made before or after. However, the film was not a financial hit. That same year, Thomas Edison created the Motion Picture Patents Company to control the film industry in both the United States and Europe. Melier's Star Films was one of the companies conglomerated into Edison's trust. I think it can be argued that this might have brought bad luck to many filmmakers, as Melier in particular started to suffer greatly. Even his 1912 film, The Conquest of the Pole, which featured elements such as the Fantastic Voyage theme used in A Trip to the Moon and The Impossible Voyage, did not make a profit. He made several other films in 1912, which ultimately were his last. He and his brother Gaston eventually had a falling out after Gaston had lost $50,000 when issues with damaged and unusable film made him unable to fulfill obligations he had with Edison's trust. He was forced to sell Star Films' American branch to Vitagraph Studios. It was a bitter pill to swallow, and Georges never spoke to Gaston again. Gaston ended up returning to Europe and died in 1915. Two years prior, Georges had incurred a large debt to Edison's trust. A moratorium was declared when the First World War started, which allowed Melier to keep his possessions. However, that was only the beginning of his troubles, as his wife Eugenie passed away, 
leaving him to raise his two children alone. Things only got worse for Melier as the French army during the war confiscated over 400 original Star Films prints and melted them to recover silver and celluloid. The recovered celluloid was used to make heels for shoes. In 1923, the theater Robert Houdin was torn down. Pathé Studios also officially took over Star Films, causing Melier to go into a furious rage. He burned all of the negatives from his studio, as well as costumes and sets. Doing so means that many of his films no longer exist, which is a real tragedy. Georges Méliès, by 1925, was a largely forgotten figure in a new cinematic world now run by what we refer to as movie moguls. He married actress Jeanne D'Alcy, and the two were able to make a living working in a small candy and toy store D'Alcy owned in Gare Montparnasse, one of Paris's railway terminals. This fall from grace is heartbreaking, especially for a filmmaker that pioneered and created many techniques we still use today. Thankfully, in 1924, there was a renewed interest in his work. Journalist Georges Michael Koysak found Melies and interviewed him for a book on cinema history. Koysak was instrumental in becoming the first film historian to show the world how important Georges Melies was to cinema. The success of the book caused a French magazine to commission a memoir about him. A domino effect had now begun for Georges Melies, as more and more journalists began to research him and his work. In 1929, there was a gala retrospective of his work at the Sao Playel Concert Hall, which he described as one of the most brilliant moments of his life. In 1931, Louis Lumiere presented Georges Méliès with the Legion of Honor Medal. Lumiere said that Méliès was, and I quote, the creator of the cinematic spectacle. He still lived in poverty, however, even with these honors and renewed interest. So the next year, the Cinema Society set up Méliès, his wife, and his granddaughter at a film industry retirement home. This was a great relief to the cinematic legend who felt truly humbled by everything done to help him and his family. For the rest of his life, Georges Méliès continued to draw, write, and even gave advice to a new generation of film fans. Georges Méliès died of cancer on January 21, 1938, at the age of 76. His passing occurred hours after another French film pioneer, Emile Cole. Georges Méliès created a legacy that virtually every filmmaker to this day around the world owes a debt of gratitude towards. He set the standard for what film could do, showing a magic that most thought could only be seen through magicians. Luckily, Méliès checked that box and was able to present audiences with a grand spectacle throughout his career. I hope you all enjoyed this latest episode. If you did, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this. Please also support us on our Patreon page. Links for all pages will be in the description box below. We look forward to showing you our next video and we want to thank you again for taking this journey with us. For my partner Joe Lewis, I'm Big Rob and we'll see you again soon.